Hi, my name is Justin Kirby, and uh, today I'll be talking about strategies for de-identifying and sharing pathology and radiology data to enable machine learning projects. In order to do this, I'll be drawing primarily from experiences managing the Cancer Imaging Archive, which is a service to the cancer imaging research community designed to help them de-identify and make available uh, large image data sets for both radiology and pathology. TCI is broken into three major components. Uh, I'll be mostly focusing on the first two here throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, the first is the data collection centers, and these are basically the tools and staffing that support data de-identification and the curation of uh, incoming data sets. Uh, the second is the data access tools. So these are the pieces of the website that allow users to browse and filter and search or, or visualize the data uh, as well as download. Um, and then the last piece is uh, data analysis centers. Um, and this is basically uh, you know, people that are part of the community that are building websites or tools which take advantage of the TCI API or that are somehow mirroring the data in order to extend the functionality um, available to the rest of the community for uh, working with our data sets. So starting with the uh, data collection center side of things and, and the de-identification challenges, uh, those of you that are familiar with DICOM are well aware that the, the files have both metadata and the pixel data. And uh, the primary challenge with de-identification of these images is dealing with all of the metadata. Um, there are hundreds of tags uh, in every single image and lots of different places where potential PHI could be living. Um, these can include things like dates, identifiers, or even uh, free text descriptions. And um, all of these things have to be uh, reviewed and, and, um, and anonymized as we process them. In addition to the metadata, uh, we also have to deal with PHI in the pixels, which you see on the right side here. Um, there are situations when uh, patient information can be burned in as text into the actual pixels. So we have to search uh, for any circumstances like that. Um, and then in addition, there are also times when, uh, you know, maybe for clinical convenience, um, things like billing records or other kinds of uh, patient documentation might be encapsulated in DICOM objects and stored in the packs. And uh, so this is another type of um, situation that we have to be careful of before we uh, make the data available. As we try to do all of this uh, de-identification um, fortunately, we didn't have to develop everything from scratch. There was uh, some existing guidance and, and actually many of the members of our team were uh, involved in some capacity uh, with uh, helping, um, helping draft this or provide feedback to it over the years. Um, but so if you check part 15, chapter E in the DICOM standard, there's a, a really huge table um, which provides tag level or element level instructions. Uh, for uh, many different DICOM tags. Um, and you'll see things like uh, D or Z in the table instructing you that you need to replace those values somehow, or X saying, you know, this is always PHI, you absolutely need to just remove this completely. Uh, K for keeping things if it's known to be safe. Uh, but then the most tricky thing is when you see C, uh, and this is basically instructing you to clean the values uh, and probably the most simple example of this would be uh, free text fields like a study description um, where, you know, it's not guaranteed to have PHI and most of the times it doesn't, um, but it's possible that a technician could have written some kind of PHI into that field and therefore you have to take a look at what the contents of that is and, and review it and take out the PHI if it exists. Um, so while there's a lot of really great uh, work that's been done to allow us to kind of um, get our feet on the ground and and build upon. Um, there's there's still a lot of uh, tricky issues when it, when you start to really get into the details of um, of anonymizing these uh, these fields. So in order to do this, um, we typically start by installing something called the our uh, clinical trial processor. This was a software that was developed. Uh, in partnership between uh, the RSNA and uh, NCI uh, quite some time ago and continues to be um, evolved. And uh, we built a 
sort of a custom graphical user interface that sits on top of this for TCIA. Uh, and we deploy this at the sites that are getting ready to send us data so that we can basically take care of all of the known PHI issues up front before the, the data even leaves the site. Um, and then after that anonymization, they have an opportunity to sort of review things themselves, make sure all the data looks good. And then once they're comfortable, they can press the transfer button and it sends it across uh, over the, securely over the internet to TCIA. Once the data are received on our end, uh, we use a tool called POSDA, which is uh, developed in-house at the University of Arkansas. Um, and uh, this takes care of a number of different things. Uh, one of the categories of uh, review that we do is to perform um, uh, DICOM conformance checks. So we're implementing a DCIOD VFY, which is actually developed by David Clooney, one of the other speakers in the session, uh, to make sure that it's conforming to the DICOM standard and that um, there aren't any situations where the data was, uh, you know, things were removed that needed to be there in order to still be interpretable by a typical piece of DICOM software. Uh, and then the other common thing that we have to do is check to make sure that the uh, references between um, things like radiation therapy structure sets or DICOM segmentations are all actually valid and um, point correctly back to the original series uh, that they were derived from. Then the other thing we do with PASTA is perform a, an additional PHI scan. Um, and again, this gets to the, you know, having to review things like uh, tags that needed to be cleaned that you know don't always have PHI, but you know there's some possibility that um, somebody could have mistakenly put things in there. Uh, and in order to do this, what POSDA does is generates a, a large spreadsheet. Um, and for those of you that are, again are familiar with DICOM, you know that most of the metadata is kind of repeated um, in every single slice, and so there's a lot of values that would be duplicates. Uh, what POSDA does is it produces a spreadsheet that only contains the unique value pairs between uh, all of the images that are in that data set. Um, so this makes it much easier for a human curator to scan down the list. They're not going to see, um, you know, a million SOP instance UIDs that are basically all the same values except for one digit changing in them. Um, so there's a lot of intelligent logic built into the system like that to make it easier to um, scan the contents of the data and figure out if there's any PHI that needs to be removed. Uh, then getting into the pixel side of things, uh, they develop, we've developed another tool called Kaleidoscope. And what this does is generates a projection images using three different window level settings. And so effectively the person who's doing the visual review, rather than having to scan through say all 100 images in a CT stack, um, can look at just these three images and be pretty confident that they've seen the entire series uh, in, in different window levels and, and can be confident that there's no text or anything like that um, in the images that might represent uh, PHI. So now moving on to histopathology, you'll see that a lot of the issues are quite similar to what I discussed on the previous slides with radiology image de-identification. Starting on the left side, you'll see an image of a digitized slide. One of the areas that we've found in reviewing pixel data in the past is that you may have cases where a pathologist has used a marker to actually write on the physical glass slide before it's scanned. So that's one area that we have to check. Then in the middle, you'll see some examples of the uh, barcodes that are attached to the slides. Uh, and so we also have to review those barcodes and labels and make sure there's nothing that looks like patient identifiers or any other kind of information there. And then on the right side, you'll see the image metadata. Reviewing the image metadata is a little bit complicated by the fact that in pathology, there's a wide variety of different vendor formats out there. And so we're often forced to use different tools and able to be able to review these things. Um, and in our, in our work to date, uh, we found that most of these metadata fields, there's not nearly as high of a risk of uh, patient data being contained in them as there is with radiology. However, you do have to keep a close eye on the image path and file name as we found oftentimes people will put different kinds of patient identifiers and, and names in those fields. Needless to say, all of this is a huge effort in terms of um, actually getting the work done and uh, requires significant human labor. 
uh, despite a number of advances in the software that have uh, automated various steps in the process. Um, so TCI at this point in time actually has five separate curation teams in addition to an infrastructure support group and multiple layers of management. Um, and, it, and it's uh, thanks to the extremely hard work of all of the folks on this slide here that we're able to uh, uh, provide the services that we do to the research community. In terms of data sources, uh, there are basically two main streams that we're receiving data through. Uh, the first is, uh, since we are an NCI-funded uh, activity, this is um, it's, it's quite common for programmatic initiatives to um, be established and, and require us to collect data. Uh, and so you can see a few examples of that here. Um, and then the other side of it is community proposals, which anyone is free to submit. So if you have a data set that you'd like to share on TCIA, you just fill out a proposal. These are reviewed on a monthly basis by an advisory group um, and then determined for acceptance and prioritization. And uh, you know, common examples of this would be data that was generated by NCI and NIH grants, which require data sharing policies. Um, it's becoming increasingly common for professional organizations uh, such as SIM, which I know has uh, has led challenges in the past um, to uh, have challenge competitions and, and often need assistance with de-identifying the data and making it available to participants. And then also publishers are becoming increasingly uh, diligent about requiring authors to share their data sets. And so we get a lot of proposals uh, in that vein as well. Uh, in terms of accessing the data, I'll kind of scoot through this section pretty quickly. Um, when you land on the homepage, uh, you can either click the submit your data button if you want to put in a proposal or you can choose access the data. Uh, from there, you'll see options to browse uh, both our, our image sets or analyses of existing images. So um, people who uh, say want to do segmentations of a collection that's already available are able to submit those results back as well and share them. Uh, then there's also being able to search both radiology and pathology data sets, uh, information on how to access our REST API, and then the Data Analysis Center component. Um, so we're just listing sites that, um, that uh, meet those criteria in some way for uh, mirroring our data or, or leveraging the API. Uh, this is just a quick look at the uh, radiology downloads and, and data portal section of the site. So for every data set, um, you'll be taken to a home page and, and you can click on search and use this uh, more granular um, filtering capabilities that you see in the top screenshot. Uh, we also recently deployed the OHIP viewer, which allows for uh, in-browser visualization of the images. Then on the pathology side, we have uh, similar functionality, although this is uh, a little bit restricted to a subset of the, path the pathology collections. Um, but at least for, for some of the newer ones, uh, you can do a similar type of uh, filtering on the different criteria. And then we also have the ability to use the CA microscope viewer to take a look at the slides in your browser. Uh, I just wanted to mention briefly that um, every data set is, is published in the same sense that an academic publication uh, is published. Um, so they have author lists and titles and abstracts and, and citations with DOIs. Um, we find that this is really important for making sure that people are uh, able to be credited for their work. Um, and then in terms of data usage policies, uh, we're almost 100% open access. You don't even need a login to, to get to the vast majority of our data sets. Um, almost everything is available under a Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, there are rare cases where, uh, restrict, where there are restrictions on commercial use. Uh, and then there's also a handful where you have to actually submit an access request. Usually these are for data sets that will eventually become public in the future. Um, in total, this has resulted in uh, 117 collections that have been made available, consisting of about 48,000 subjects and over 50 million images. Uh, an additional 24 analysis results data sets, which are based on uh, analyses of TCI images. Uh, this covers, again, radiology, histopathology, also radiation therapy modalities. Um, 43 of those 117 collections actually have histopathology imaging. Um, this is uh, 
covering a wide variety of different types of cancers as well as phantom data. And almost all of the data sets at this point um, now have some kind of supporting data, whether it's patient demographics, outcomes, uh, other types of image analyses, and actually a large number of them even have genomics and proteomics data available. This has resulted in uh, about 20,000 users coming to the site every month to access these data sets and downloads of about 100 terabytes a month. Um, we have another 30 or so incoming data sets that are being actively curated, so lots more stuff coming down the line. Um, and over or nearly 900 publications have now been written about the data, uh, as well as lots of um, sort of anecdotal feedback from folks on the industry side of things, letting us know that uh, it's been really helpful to them getting their businesses started thanks to the Creative Commons uh, permissive licensing. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to encourage you to follow us on social media. Um, this will allow you to get uh, push notification updates on new data sets and uh, you know, new site features and publications um, based on TCI data. And I'd just like to acknowledge all the folks that helped make this happen and thank you for your time.